Dune Part 2 is finally out and has already been described by many as a science fiction masterpiece, even compared to classics like the Lord of the Rings movies. The movie does seem to make it all work, with sandworms, a love story, heavy political and philosophical messages, spy strips and psychotic albinos, on top of two and a half hours of stunning visuals with very little exposition. The Dune novels have repeatedly been described by many as unfilmable, and not without good reason. Herbert built a universe that is very detailed and fleshed out, a story almost unfathomably grand in scope, and characters with deep, complex motivations, not to mention the many otherworldly elements in the story that do not always have a visual counterpart, such as prescience, the ability to see the future, or the water of life. To add on top of that, for the most part we are presented with internal monologues and thoughts of the characters instead of dialogue and action, so it is already a challenge to convey character motivations without them being easy to misinterpret. Part 2 adapts the second half of the first Dune novel, written by Frank Herbert, relatively faithfully, but still makes some big changes to the original story and characters and leaves questions unanswered. So what are these changes, and why does it feel like the movies have barely scratched the surface of the books? In this video I will dig into these changes and try to find out what purpose they serve, and in the meantime unravel why, in my opinion, Dune is still impossible to adapt, even though the movies are excellent. Important to note that there will be spoilers in this video for the two Villeneuve Dune movies and the first Dune novel, but nothing specific regarding the sequels. Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil what happens next in the story. The new Villeneuve is not the first person to attempt to adapt Dune. After Jodorowsky's project was canned, David Lynch's 1984 version was almost universally disliked by book fans, moviegoers found it confusing, and even Lynch himself hated it, admittedly. Sci-Fi Channel made a series that covers Dune, Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, which followed the source material quite faithfully, but without the budget of a Hollywood movie it is very hard to adapt the world of Arrakis without it being off-putting, especially today with special effects that almost feel real, and others that we don't even notice for how real they look. I'll talk about these adaptations a bit more further down the line. I think both adaptations have merits of their own. But what makes a good adaptation? We have to take a look at some major factors when we talk about Dune, like the story, atmosphere, lore and themes. Does the movie follow the original story beats? How much gets cut and why? Does it feel like you are watching a visual representation of Arrakis that Herbert created? How much of the original lore is present in the movie, be that through exposition or visual representation? And does the movie follow through with the message and morals of the original story? Let's take a look at the story and characters first. Probably the most bold decision from Villeneuve was to shorten how much time passes in Dune Part 2. The events of the movie happen throughout a roughly 6 to 8 months timeline, while multiple years go by in the book. This results in many of the changes that are the most noticeable. You may have heard about how Chani is so different in the movie and how Alia is actually born in the first book. The decision to shorten the time that passes in the story was, I would guess due to runtime and pacing concerns, but the result is a quite streamlined experience where the story does not drag. We get to see how Paul becomes acquainted with the Fremen lifestyle alongside Jessica. After that, we are introduced to Fade Rauta Harkonnen, directly followed by the story of Paul coming to terms with his role as a messiah figure and finally accepting it, leading to the final battle and conclusion. The main story beats of the movie follow the book pretty closely in general, but due to the shorter time the relationship between Paul and Chani is quite different. Book Chani is not the same Chani as movie Chani, let's just get that out of the way. Book Chani is the daughter of Liet Kynes, who was played by Sharon Duncan Brewster in the first movie, and she does not doubt Paul as the leader and quizzes Hadarak. She is quite supportive of him in fact. It's important to note that Book Kynes is a man, Chani's father. As a planetologist, Kynes is the one who comes up with the idea to terraform Arrakis, hence why generations of Fremen are hoarding water, with the hope of turning the planet into a green Eden one day. Kynes earns the respect of the Fremen with this promise, and Chani is committed to her father's dream. The loss of her father affects her deeply, much like how Paul is affected by the loss of his father later, and the two bond over this loss, which is quite touching and a shame that it wasn't included in the movie. As years go by in the book, the bond between Paul and Chani is much stronger, and they even have a child, Leto II, who is tragically killed by the Harkonnens as a baby. The death of their son brings the two even closer, so much so that Chani willingly, though not without doubts, accepts Paul's marriage to Princess Irulan and stays with him as his concubine, much like how Lady Jessica was to Leto. This is of course helped by the fact that Paul explains to her in the books what a political marriage is and vows to her that he shall never even touch Irulan. I very much suspect that this specific change, Chani leaving at the end of the movie and Paul's promise getting cut, is more of a cliffhanger that serves to lure in audiences for part 3. I would not imagine Villeneuve deciding to break the two apart completely, as we have seen visions of the two together in part 1, and Paul says something along the lines of, she will come round, I have seen it, in part 2. 
Furthermore, without spoiling Messiah, it would be pretty much be impossible to adapt the sequel if Chani was just riding worms and crying the whole time. The changes to her personality, however, serve a different purpose. Villeneuve has stated that his goal with the movie was to successfully translate Frank Herbert's original message with Dune. Herbert was quoted to be disappointed in his readers, seeing Paul as a hero to look up to, and this was part of the reason he wrote Dune Messiah the way he did. Paul is not supposed to be a hero, he is more of an anti-hero, a quite tragic one as well, if you really think about it, but more on that later. Herbert wanted to highlight the dangers of messiahical figures influencing the masses, the consequences of sheep think and blind religious dogma. He thought that charismatic leaders and superhero-like figures could be a huge danger to society, and Paul's actions have consequences that demonstrate that very clearly. Villeneuve decided to use Chani as a contrast to Paul, a sort of living, breathing conscience who highlights the absurdity of the feminine, ready to leave their way of life, and in general completely give up their lives for someone they don't know. I think given the shorter time frame, this Chani comes off pretty natural, as why years of bonding and the baby can easily explain book Chani, not questioning Paul's choices, it makes sense for a Fremen survivor not to trust her lover completely, whom she has merely known for a few months. The idea to use her character in order to enforce a message that was also important to Frank Herbert is a noble one in my opinion, and if Villeneuve does not stray too hard from the main story in Dune Messiah in the sequel, I can see it working fine and it makes sense in the context of the movie. Another big change that makes the ending of the movie even more different from the book is Paul's sister, Alia. When Lady Jessica takes the water of life, she successfully transmutates the poison and survives. However, it has a significant effect on her and the baby. Understandably so, the movie also cuts the subsequent spice orgy, during which the Fremen drink from the now purified water. As for the effects of the poison, Jessica comes to possess the memories of all reverend mothers before her, and Alia comes to possess the memories of all her ancestors, male and female, that were hidden in her genetic code and are surfaced by the exposure to the water. These genetic memories are even described as being conscious, resulting in a multitude of people with thoughts, memories and voices within Jessica and Alia. Not quite what we see in the movie, but this concept is visually implied and will probably be further explained in the sequel, I'm guessing. As Alia has all those memories within her, she is pre-born, with not only the ability to speak to her ancestors, but with wisdom that very few others possess. In the books, she is actually the one who kills the Baron by poisoning him with a Gomjabar, not Paul. I think the change here is kind of justified. Within the context of the movie, Jessica's pregnancy shows the passing of time very naturally, without forced exposition, and Paul killing the Baron is a satisfying conclusion to the revenge storyline. We get a glimpse into what being a reverend mother and preborn means, and we even see a little cameo from older Alia, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, which is in my opinion sufficient enough without coming off as too far-fetched compared to the style of the two movies. Not to mention how hard it would be to depict a two-year-old with the wisdom of her ancestors, killing people on the battlefield without it looking ridiculous. Some things just translate better on the page, although I would have loved to see Villeneuve pull it off. Before delving into Paul's character, some other changes should be highlighted as well. The fear of art is completely gone from the movie. Villeneuve has stated that they shot scenes with the actor, but decided not to include them in the final cut. Since he expressed how hard it was for him to cut scenes, I'm guessing it was mostly due to runtime issues, as the movie was already 3 hours long. Book the Fear is a very interesting storyline, however. He's captured by the Harkonnens, and after the attack on Arakin, he's taken hostage. The Baron feeds him poison that only he has the antidote to, and feeds him the lie that Lady Jessica was the one who betrayed the Atreides. Havat uses this opportunity to plot revenge against the Harkonnens and Jessica. In the books, he's the one who arranges the Atreides warrior not to be drugged during the gladiator sequence with Fade Rautha, in order to create friction between the Baron and Fade. As he was forced to help the Harkonnens fight a Fremen leader called Muad'Dib throughout his years of servitude, he takes his own life at the end of the book after realizing he was working against his beloved Paul the whole time. I would have loved to see this story play out on the big screen, but Havat already had a shortened screen time in the first part, and his absence is not that jarring in the sequel. If it were up to me, honestly I would have preferred to have this storyline by cutting some of the scenes with Rabban or Chani in the second half, but I understand though, and this is something that genuinely wouldn't bug me if I hadn't read the book. As opposed to Havat, who was cut from the movie, we actually get quite a bit of screen time with Rabban, who was barely in the book at all mostly just mentioned by others, described as kind of a dumb but strong psychopath. I enjoyed Dave Batista's performance a lot, and it was a nice surprise to see more of his character, and it resulted in a well set of satisfaction when Gurney Halleck killed him at the end. Speaking of Gurney, we actually see him play some music on his belly set, which was nice to see. His character is a bit toned down in the movies, like most characters that have a gripe with Lady Jessica in the book, as there is quite a bit of tension between Book Gurney and Jessica. He does not trust her at all, and has some serious reservations about the Bene Gesserit. He even tries to kill her, as he also thinks she was Leto's traitor, but Paul stops him just in time, 
which makes his loyalty to the Atreides even stronger. Politics and lore are also lacking a bit in this movie compared to the book. We don't see a spacing gear navigator at the end. Not much is said or shown regarding the Landsrad and the other houses and spice melange becomes a bit of a background element. It is not explained that spice is the result of the life cycle of sandworms, although we do see how water is lethal to them, which is very important down the line. As a result, the events of the movie definitely feel less grand in scope compared to the book. We feel a weight of Paul's actions, but more on the character's side. Him threatening to destroy the spice affects the whole known universe, which is what brings the Emperor to eventually kneel, while Spacing Guild members who have a limited ability to see the future confirm that it is indeed in his power to do so. The Spacing Guild are the real tyrants of the Dune universe, with monopoly on space travel, but their ability to see the future just enough to navigate ships is due to spice melange, plus they depend on the spice, they would actually die without it, which is why they persuade the Emperor to back down. Count Fenrig, the Emperor's friend, dangerous assassin and the failed attempt of a Kvizet Hadera breeding program of the Bene Gesserit is also cut from the movie, who refuses to kill Paul near the end of the book and joins Shaddam in exile. We get to see his wife, however, Lady Margot, played by Leah Sidhu, who gives an excellent performance and a nice glimpse into how the Bene Gesserit operates. Now let's talk about Paul, because I see a lot of people confused about him, and even more that are just plain wrong. Some even call him the real villain of Dune, which is a very superficial way of looking at the character, but understandable after only watching the movie. On the surface, Paul's story fits the classic hero's journey formula perfectly. He's the chosen one, with unique abilities, but tragedy and loss befalls on him. He overcomes all obstacles, accepts and trains to become who he was destined to be, and eventually takes revenge on the villain, and even gets the throne and the hand of the princess at the end. Like a fairy tale, where they live happily ever after. Everything feels off. Frank Herbert subverted the predictable hero's journey storyline in every way possible. Paul is the chosen one, but that is the result of shady genetic planning, breeding programs and scheming, not some magical prophecy. That is the origin of his powers, along with the fact that he was trained of Mentat and Bene Gesserit skills, which makes him a human computer that has control over every molecule in his body. He does take revenge on the killers of his father and house, but there are dire consequences to this. The way he can achieve victory is through becoming a religious figure for the Fremen, eventually resulting in a war affecting the whole universe and killing billions, as his messiahical concept outgrows him beyond his control. To quote Frank Herbert, I had a theory that superheroes were disastrous for humans, that even if you postulated an infallible hero, the things this hero set in motion fell eventually into the hands of fallible mortals. What better way to destroy a civilization, society or a race than to set people into the wide oscillations which followed their turning over the critical judgment and decision-making faculties to a superhero. Paul is much more of a human in the movie. In the books he could be described as someone much more than a man but less than a god. Also, movie Paul's actions and motivations are less clear. The movie portrays revenge as Paul's main motivation. While important, Paul in reality is also driven and at the same time torn by his visions of humanity's future. After taking the water of life, it becomes clear to him that humanity as a whole is on a path to extinction, tragedy and death. The only possible solution, the golden path he sees, is to embrace becoming a messiah and taking control of the universe, while foreseeing that in doing so he will be the reason for the death of billions. The movies don't really give this attention, but Paul was genuinely shook by having to kill Jamis. In the first book he cries after taking his life, which cements him already as a respectable figure among the Fremen as giving water to the dead, as they say, is the utmost form of respect for Jamis. After the water of life tears down the barriers within Paul and gives way to the full range of his prescient abilities, he feels the weight of humanity's fate on his shoulders and tries to make the best decision based on what he sees, along with the disastrous jihad that he cannot stop after he steps on the path. In a way he becomes a slave to his own future as he precisely sees the consequences of every action he takes, no matter how much more than a man he is, in the end he really is just a man, forever burdened by his choices that permanently change the entire world. Considering how hard it was for me to jam all this lore into 15 minutes, I think Villeneuve did a tremendous job with Dune, part 1 and 2 as well. He prioritized looking at the movie from a filmmaker's perspective, which is a good thing, while clearly respecting the source material. The inclusion of easter eggs like Princess Irulan dictating for the archives, the several lines that were almost word by word taken from the book really make the end product feel like a labor of love, and what more can someone who loves the original work ask for? 
He decided to adapt the main story, gave a lot of attention to atmosphere and setting in place of lore exposition, and even more attention to the message that inspired Herbert to write Paul's story in the first place. The end result is something that is much simpler than the book, but a gem, that will probably inspire many others to read the books as well. Changes to the source material in an adaptation is not a red flag by default. There are some great movies that stray very far from the original work, like Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which is almost infamous among Stephen King fans for leaving out the majority of the original story and changing significant parts of the novel. While quite an extreme example, I would argue that The Shining is not a good adaptation of the original book, but that does not mean it is not a masterpiece and a staple of horror movies. It seems like Kubrick had an idea and vision and used the novel as a fitting template in pursuit of his creative endeavors. If you look at Shawshank Redemption, on the other hand, another Stephen King adaptation, we have a movie that very closely follows the source material, but changes the ending in order to achieve a very emotionally satisfying catharsis, which arguably fits the medium more than the original ending would have done so. Most would argue that Shawshank is not only an amazing movie, but a great adaptation as well. On the other hand, we have adaptations that are almost universally hated by book fans, like the Netflix Witcher series and the Aragon movie from 2006 where the creator seemingly did not even attempt to stay faithful to the OG material and had a different goal in mind that did not pay off in the end. Considering all this, I think that Dune as it is is still impossible to adapt, especially as a movie. Maybe with the budget and talent behind Villeneuve's movies, a high-profile series format could work, but we will probably never know. The sci-fi original Dune series tried to follow the books very faithfully, with lots of cut content from both movies being present but clearly the budgetary limitations hurt the end product, which often felt more like a stage play than a TV show. David Lynch's Dune movie has been ripped apart by many, but has definitely developed a cult following over the years. The issue of the absurdly detailed lore and context was attempted to be solved by lots of exposition, with many creative liberties taken, changes to the story and, well, let's just say, goofy special effects. Let me know if you would like to see a video on Lynch's version of Dune or the sci-fi series as well. Director Alejandro Jodorowsky was actually the original director tied to the Dune project, along with a very stacked cast and crew including H.R. Geiger, Salvador Dali and Mick Jagger, but his script was so vast, the film would have been 10 to 14 hours long, and with the studio wanting a two-hour movie and Jodorowsky sticking to his script partially due to his respect for the original book, the project was handed to Lynch in the end. The moral is, every time someone tries to adapt Dune, some things just have to be sacrificed for it to fit the screen. Compromises just have to be made, and I think that's okay. You can't have the full story, every side character, exposition for all the lore regarding spice, the houses, the ecology of Arrakis, pre-born babies, people with infinite ancestors living inside them, intricate politics and scheming, realistic sandworms, and every character, along with their motivations and ways of thinking properly represented for the audiences to understand, all in one movie. I would argue that not even two or three movies would be enough. Not to mention that some things are not that exciting for the average moviegoer. When Dune Part 1 came out, the movie already cut a lot of the exposition, with much of the lore and politics left for the imagination, and tons of people still found it boring, with some fans of the book who found it lacking. Villeneuve realized this and took a very valued approach of sticking to his vision and making the best of the things he took from the book while simultaneously piquing the interest of the viewers to delve even deeper into the world if they want by reading Frank Herbert's timeless classic or watching videos like this. In the era of creative bankruptcy in Hollywood, with almost every other major project being a sequel, remake, prequel or spin-off, Dune feels like a breath of fresh air. After so many movie adaptations of famous novels, we finally have someone who clearly loves the source material. I miss movies being an event, especially after the virus and the rise of streaming. Not many movies feel like a world event nowadays. People are starting to feel burnt out on superhero movies, and not even a Spielberg or Scorsese movie can break even at the box office anymore. It really feels like the only people still moving real masses with original ideas and creative visions are Villeneuve and Christopher Nolan. And I hope the success of Dune Part 2 inspires studios not only to greenlight sequels, but to trust visionaries. Villeneuve's last few movies have not been box office miracles, not even close, so I feel like we are lucky even to get Part 2 in this day and age, where 4 out of 5 big budget movies are a box office bomb with serious reshoots, bloated budgets and severe studio interference. And finally, what did you think about Dune Part 2? Were you a fan or were you disappointed? And also, 
If you have read the book, what would you have liked to see on the screen that didn't make it in the end? Let me know below in the comments, I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and pressing the like button, and see you soon.